Well, blessings, friends, blessings, blessings. This is Bishop Andre Woods, and I want to welcome you to this edition of This Is My Story. We thank God for you joining us today, and this is what I want you to do. I want you to like and share, like and share, and we're going to have a great conversation today. Some very special guests is on with us today. And listen, you're going to be blessed by testimony and certainly the story of these two very fine young women of God. Again, uh, make your way to Bishop Andre S. Woods' page. Uh, we'll be on our other platforms as well as uh, uh, Fellowship of Music and Arts, Interdenominational Assembly of Churches USA, as well as my personal page. Andre Sonny Woods. You don't want to miss a moment of this conversation today. It's going to be very in-depth, and uh, certainly we know that uh, you're going to be blessed. I pray that you all had a blessed Sunday, the last Sunday of the month of May, this Grace Month, and certainly we're moving on uh, to next month. It's the holiday weekend, and we're looking for God to bless us as we go. Well, I want you to help me welcome to our platform today, uh, our guest, uh, uh, the one and only Lady Wanda, Paulette Craig and Lady Sherry Jackson Carwell. Bless you all and thank you for being here today. Y'all scared to talk. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello ladies. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Uh, we thank you for being with us and sharing the day. I done lost Wanda. Come on back, Wanda. And uh, this is going to be a blessed time for all of us today. Uh, I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to pray, and then we're going to start talking. Is that okay? Blessings. Right. Let's bow our head. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for these two women of God, and we Thank you for their lives and their testimony. Now we pray that you bless us as we share, that all that we share from our heart and our spirits will be a blessing to someone who might be listening on today. And we ask your Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, uh, and we pray that this testimony will be edifying and you will be glorified in all that we say and do. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. Well, amen. listen, I am so happy that you all uh, consented uh, that we can have this kind of dialogue and conversation, which I think sometimes is something, you know, people in the church don't want to talk about certain things, but we just thank God for you uh, willing to share your, your testimony and how God has blessed you to move on. Both of you uh, were, were married to uh, pastors, giants in the gospel uh, men of God, pastors, founding pastors at that. Uh, and certainly we thank God for uh, you being able to come on and share this story with us today. I got two of you, Wanda, today. And uh, I want, I want uh, us to talk about this and uh, we're going to take our time. And uh, I know this kind of conversation can be a little bit tedious when you lost a loved one, a, a soulmate, and a, especially a man of God who has given so much, not only to uh, his wife and his family, but to the church, to the people of God, the extended family, so to speak. So uh, Wanda, I'm gonna start with you, and I want you to uh, just talk to us about your journey with our friend, uh, Bishop Charles Craig, I mean, I, I've been knowing you guys, I mean, since whenever. <laughs> it's been a while since we were yeah. kids, like, and uh, growing up in church, I met you all at Our Faith Prayer Tabernacle. So what was it like being uh, the man of God's wife and then after he was called into the ministry and then eventually starting his own church? That, that didn't have nothing. That's outside of his musical career. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, glad to know, see you all with us today. 
Well, my journey started, well, like you say, we was very, very young. Uh, I met him when I was singing with the uh, Elma Hendrix and the Community Youth Ensemble. Then I started going to Prayer Tabernacle and then one thing led to another and we got uh, hitched. I was 19, 19 years old when I got married. And of course he was a director. So he was, you know, directing the choir. And um, at that time it was just, it was a great time because we were young and in love. And, you know, it was, it was a fun time even in the church. And as we got older, we grew, we moved from prayer, prayer tabernacle uh, on 104 Elliott to 5771 West Grand Boulevard. And again, that's where his uncle, Reverend David Craig, uh, was the pastor. And then after so many years, uh, he was called into the ministry. God called him to start his own ministry. So January, 1984, we started uh, Craig Memorial and we had our services. I can't think of the, the name of the hall right there on Livinois and Six Mile. We turned it into a church. They'd had to go in and set up the altar and set the cheers up and then take it down. Um, that was very tedious. And so um, then we found our second, uh, what's that? The second location was on um, Seven Mile, Seven Mile and Myers. Uh, we had our own building there. And, you know, the, the latest church coming on, people started coming. And um, we had a very nice, nice, nice time. And then he moved again. That was good enough. That's when we moved on Puritan. And that was a gas station and everybody thought he had lost his mind. Like, what are we gonna do with this gutted out building? But as you can see, it turned out very well. And, um, and you know, being a first lady, it was trial and error because growing up in the church, well, the Baptist church, I never had a first lady. So I didn't know anything about being a first lady and what she was supposed to do and what she wasn't supposed to do. So I just, it was a, a, a training on the job, so to speak. And um, I'm sure I had a lot of hits, <laughs> misses, but I had some hits. I know I got a lot of misses, but you know, it's, it's not easy being a pastor's wife. Everybody thinks it's all glory, but it's not. You, you, it's hard work. You, uh, you plan a trip or you plan something, it gets canceled because somebody's get called and they gotta go and see about so-and-so. They gotta go get somebody's son out of jail. They gotta go to the hospital. So it, it's, it's, very, it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. And I, the, the first ladies I see nowadays, uh, all they wanna do is look fabulous and glorious and wonderful. And uh, that was not my beginning. Let me see, I sang in the choir. I did the praise and worship. At that time it was devotion good old devotion songs. I, um, I set up the communion. I took down the communion. I cleaned up the communion. I cleaned the communion cloth. I got the people ready for baptism. I put them on their robes and took the stuff home to wash it and bring it back, drag it back. And carrying those wet clothes is not easy. So it's a, it was a lot of work. And then yeah, I was on the missionary board. So when they had something, I had to be in that. But I told them I'm not going in no kitchen because they didn't come help me do nothing. I'm like, kitchen's off limits. I didn't do kitchen, but I would help clean up. But during this, I was in service. They were in the kitchen because I had to do the uh, devotion and bring the choir. I think I did everything but play the organ and preach. Because when the minister didn't come to bring in the uh, choir, who did it? me. Then I had to run and get in the choir in my spot. And if the director didn't come, who waved their hands? Me. Then when he did come, I had to run and get back in my spot. I mean, but I loved it. I, I can't complain because God has been good to me. I loved every bit of it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. And then that dreadful day of uh, July the 5th, 2008, First of all, I lost my job, I think a week before that. The week before that, we were in Las Vegas. We took a trip and it was just us. And that's the first time, we, that's the first time we've ever been anywhere by ourselves. 
somebody's always, <laughs> right, somebody has always gone on trips with us, namely Lindsay, his brother. But it's all good. But that was the first time we went by ourselves and we came home, got ready for the holiday. We were over some friend's house. We had a nice time, come home. He's, he's sitting on the couch, looking at TV. I'm getting ready for bed and fireworks going off. I get in the bed. I don't even remember when he came to bed. All I know is God woke me up. I mean, I sat straight up and I looked over at him and he was in the midst of having a heart attack. And uh, it, it was horrible. It was horrible. That was the worst day of my life. And I was praying, I was anointing him. I was doing everything I could but God had other plans. Um, needless to say, I was mad at God. They say, you can't get mad at God. Well, I did, and I'm sure he knew it. But in spite of it all, he blessed me. And then uh, he, he died in um, July. I, I had to move in January. I had to find me a place to live because um, the house was too much. I, know, I knew I couldn't afford to stay there. And I knew the church. Well, they, I had to move. So anyway, I moved and um, where I am now is where I, I moved to. But um, I thank God for the journey. It wasn't easy at all. You know, you, you go out and you're used to going places with somebody. You're used to having somebody around. You're used to, it's just a whole different lifestyle. Like I said, we were 19, I was 19. so. And we were married for 40, together 40 years before he passed. So um, it was a tough journey, but as you can see through it all, God has kept me and you have been faithful. You have been a friend indeed. You've always called me to see how I was doing. You take us widows out to dinner, <laughs> me and Sherry. And I want to tell you, I appreciate you. And I thank you so much for all your time and what you've invested in me. And I bless you, Bishop. And that's, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. You are so blessed. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you for sharing that because there are so many times uh, I have friends and, and they talk about, um, you know, what happens after the passing of, of their husband or their, or their pastor. And, and every situation is not the same. And I knew it was something, you know, doing his musical career i know the traveling on the road and mm -hmm. the craig crusaders yeah. you know all of that time we spent now you you got your tablet and your phone on you got we got two wonder craigs on today okay well my tablet <laughs> i didn't know my tablet uh the voice the audio stopped so i'm like let me grab my telephone <laughs> i listen whatever works we got we got you going and okay. and thank you we, we we'll come back and talk some more because i know okay uh, I want to get uh, uh, Lady Carwell in. Sherry, 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 my little sweetheart. Listen, uh, I met Sherry. Matter of fact, I think it was workshop or coming to Craig Memorial. It, it was before that. I don't know. But we crossed paths <laughs> and uh, such an a, a awesome singer, musician, and songwriter, you know. And, and when I heard, I said, oh, Looks are deceiving. She can play and sing. Look at God. <laughs> you know? But I had heard, but I had never witnessed uh, her full music ministry for my own personal self. But uh, thank God for you, Sherry, and how the Lord has brought you and kept you. I want you to walk us through your, your experience uh, when, when the Lord called Pastor Carwell home. and Well, you know, just the whole journey and how you've been blessed since that time. Okay, well, I too wanna to acknowledge and thank you for this opportunity. And I wanna say hello and God bless you to um, my former first lady, um, Lady <laughs> Craig, I love her too. I, I briefly was able to be at Craig Memorial with her and I'm grateful for that too. Um, let's see. I. For those of you who don't know, my late husband is the Reverend Dr. J. Allen Caldwell. He was the founder of the Burnett Baptist Church, which started at Russell and Garfield, 
the the most known location is 30th and Kyle, uh, where he had a successful broadcast that really enlarged the ministry. He was known for prayer time. And then in 1977, uh, they purchased the property at 16801 Schoolcraft, uh, which is right off the Southfield Freeway. And this was a very historic uh, event. Um, of course, it's no secret that there's a tremendous age difference between myself and my husband. Uh, but I know the history because he talked to me a lot about it. This was in a neighborhood, um, it's right across from, um, I cannot think, what is the name of that subdivision? Uh, not Russell Woods, I can't think of it right now, but um, this was really still primarily a white area. And he was able to start the first Black Baptist school in the state of Michigan. Uh, and a lot of people went to JAC Academy. Um, Chris Weber was one of the students. Just a lot of people. Um, at one time, that school was 500 kids strong. And he carried that school up until when the charter schools came on the scene. Uh, the competition was just too much. And so we carried the school probably up until, I would say 2002. And then we just went to the daycare. Um, I came to, I'd always known of Burnett, of course, um, Rance Allen and the prayer ball and all that thing, but I had never met him personally, just seeing him from a distance. Um, and in two. No, 1997, um, I got laid off from my job. And my coworker used to listen to Martha Gina Queen religiously. And the Queen said, Pastor Caldwell is looking for a musician. <laughs> um, if, if, if you know somebody or you want to you wanna play, uh, here's the number. So my coworker said, uh, you should go and interview at Burnett. Well, I thought that was way out of my ability. You know, this was a big town church. I never played um, at a church that size, um, but I had been playing for churches since I was about 14 years old. And so I just went over there just to see, you know, what would happen. And so um, initially I was supposed to work with the youth, the young people, uh, but he gave me a full-time position where I could accompany. And, and um, like Sister Chris said, one thing led to another. <laughs> and uh, we got married in 2000. And um, during that time, uh, right before we got married, he had to have his one of his legs amputated um, because of diabetes. And um, that was a... a I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anybody really that had ever really suffered um, a real major health challenge because of diabetes. I knew people who took, you know, the insulin or whatever, but it actually affected him until he had to have his leg amputated. But um, I decided to go on and marry him. And we, uh, the Lord gave us five years together, not as long as the Chris, but it was a full five years wow. and I lived a wonderful life um I don't have the same testimony as you know sister Craig I didn't have to go through a lot of I have my own struggles don't get me wrong but I, I didn't have to go through you know a founder uh that's not no joke you know you are starting from scratch thank god when I got to the scene the pews and the organ was already there, <laughs> you know. But I, he told me, you know, um, that there were times where he had a car where there was no floor in the in the bottom. He could see through it, and there were times where he had to set up the chairs and 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 do the duplicator with the bulletins one by one and all of that. But the Lord blessed him with a very large congregation. At the strongest, they were like three thousand strong. Um, and when he died, our role was still uh, about 675. So the Lord gave him a very prosperous, a very 
successful and blessed ministry for 52 years. And um, I was able to be there from 97 until 2005. After he died, uh, I kind of went through, I was cut off actually before he died. Um, he didn't believe in me really working anywhere. I worked at the church as uh, the administrator of the, of the school. And I also was uh, on payroll as a musician of the church, but those things were taken from me. And uh, my income was cut off before Reverend died. But one thing Reverend always told me down throughout the years, he said he was never ever worried about me because he knew I was a survivor. And so um, I have not missed a beat. I moved a couple of times, but every time I moved, it has been, it, it's been fine, you know, and now I have my own place and I still drive new cars and all of that. God has been good to me. So uh, in his words, uh, God will never let faithfulness go unrewarded. And I guess you could say that's my testimony. Amen. Well, it's an awesome, it's an awesome testimony. And uh, I mean, we don't take anything lightly or for granted, you know, uh, to be in that kind of situation. I've, I've heard some horror stories in the last few years from uh, widows of uh, pastors from across the country and, and they were not nice. You know, some of them ended up in court, some of them, you know, end up put out of the parsonage and just horror stories. And, and I'm wondering what, what does the church do? I mean, why, what are they thinking uh, uh, in these cases when the Bible instructs us to take care of the widows and orphans? And um, it's just so sad how people, money changes people. I mean, here you have somebody who's given their life to help build uh, with the help of God. But God works through men. God works through people. And they struggle and they sacrifice. And a lot of times the sacrifice was out of their house, out of their pocket. Amen. You know, I, I used to, uh, Wanda, I used to fuss at Craig. You know, we would talk if not every Sunday night, at least sometime on Monday right. about our churches. You know, when I was pastoring Revival Tabernacle, I told him, I said, man, this thing is changing. Uh, and during those seasons back in the late 90s, going into the new millennium and into the 2000, you know, people were losing jobs. Uh, people were relocating mm -hmm. and people were starting training. Uh, I mean, it got the economy. The uh, uh, the big three was shut down and, and laying a lot. And then in this town, you know, a lot of our people worked at either Ford, General Motors or, or Cadillacs or, you know, Chrysler, one of the big three if they wasn't into other uh, career uh, interests. But um, and it hit a lot of our people, a lot of people, you know, you remember Michigan Bell shut down. People exactly. had to buy, they bought, got buyouts and it was just, it was just really bad. And I, I was saying to uh, Pastor Craig, I, I called him, I called Charlie Green. I called, I called all my boys. I called back then, I called Bishop Foster because we had started IAC during those years. I called Foster, I called everybody. I said, listen, uh, Christ died for the church and we don't have to. And I said, now y'all, y'all may not agree with me, but I don't think if it gets rough, you know, they say, oh, wolves don't do it. I said, no, I listen. We got to do what we got to do. You can always begin again. And so uh, Pastor Craig would always call me and I'm telling you, we would have some conversations mm -hmm. about the saints. Yes, and the ain'ts. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we would do pastoral uh, a comparison of what our Sundays was like and how people are faring. And, uh, and I tell you, one thing I can say about my friend, he loved people so, and uh, they got in his heart. And I, and I told him, and we used to talk all the time, and, and, and uh, like God told Moses, don't let the people get in your heart. 
because sometimes in my experience, I know when the people get in your heart, mm-hmm. you start listening gotcha. to the people more than God. And you start really doing things that 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 you shouldn't be doing. You offer them crutches rather than letting them stand on their own. It's just too much for any pastor or one man or one church to try to handle. Because a lot of people come to church for what they can get, not what they can give or do. And uh, I know Pastor Craig, he was he was just a benevolent guy. Every mm-hmm. time you look around, I was hearing stories about he done got somebody out of jail, he done paid somebody's rent, car note, he done done, done this, done. I'm like, man, you can't do all that. You know, I learned early, 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 early. And uh, a founding pastor is so enough different from a pastor that inherits a legacy or a church. Sometimes these guys get churches that are paid for, Mm -hmm. money in the bank, and people. But when you're starting a church, you just have to go on what God says, his word and faith, and trust that he will give provision for the vision. So when we look at these stories of these two giants in our city uh, and all their contributions to help make Detroit, I believe, a, a household name when it came to churches, you can't you can't live in this town and not know the name of uh, the Reverend James Allen Carwell. You can't live in this town and not know the name Bishop Charles Craig. Uh, you know, and then of course uh, they were known both him and his brother as the Craig brothers. There's no you have to be living under a rock not to know those names. And everywhere I'd go across the country, you would know. Who do you know this one? Do you know that one? Yes, yes, we know them. And so uh, since that time, what has it been like, y'all? Because, you know, we go out and we have a ball and uh, fellowship and talk. And um, I thank God for you all's friendship and love, you know, because uh, uh, I know in Charles's case, you know, uh, I tell women all the time, when a pastor like that has friends, that wife has to believe and trust that they really are friends. You know, because everybody that, that, like you said, smile in your face, sometimes they won't take your place, you know, and uh, everybody's not a friend. But I can truly say, and even with Pastor Carwell, the times I've had the privilege of, of uh, sharing with him years ago, uh, he was so complimentary. He'd see me in a restaurant, pay for my dinner and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, when I would go to the church, I had a few times to play. We're back in the Joe Norris days for their broadcast and even had a chance to work with the uh, choir on a recording that that his daughter did, Quintella, uh, Reverend James Cleveland presents, Gregory Troy and myself. So I remember all those days. We used to rush to 30th and Cobb and, and to get in on the broadcast, watch them dim those lights for prayer time. My God help us. You know, and then when they moved, uh, out, uh, where they are now. Thank God for those legacies and those giants uh, in ministry. So now uh, you've been blessed and life is moving on and it's been some time, it's been some years. And I know that grief process must have been some somewhat difficult. And so just talk to us about, because I know uh, grieving takes time. Uh, these kinds of wounds take time to heal. So, uh, uh, Sister Craig, I mean, when you think about how long it's been and how you got to where you are, what was that journey like while you were processing and healing? Uh, well, it just, it wasn't easy. Um, like you said, um, it, it was tough because the church lost a pastor, true enough. I lost my husband. I lost my friend. I lost my children's father. I lost two incomes, mine and his. (laughs) (laughs) So that's I'm mad at God. I mean, this is the time we're supposed to be uh, sitting back, relaxing and enjoying each other. And we didn't even get a chance to do any of that, anything. So yeah, yeah, I was mad at God. And I didn't pray for quite a while. I'll tell anybody I was mad at him, but he knew I was mad at him. 
He knew why I was mad at him. And he just waited until I got my ignorance organized <laughs> and got myself together. You know, I stayed at the church. I didn't stop doing what I was doing. I kept doing my duties. I stayed there for four years. And then I just started feeling um, lost. I started feeling empty. Like, who am I? What am I gonna do now? Um, it was rough. So um, there were many days I sat in a chair and just asked the Lord, help me. What am I gonna do? What do you want me to do? Where am I gonna go? So I, I remember um, I was in the choir stand one Sunday. We had just got finished singing and everybody was leaving out. And I don't know why I was still in the choir stand because I'm usually the first one out. And I heard the spirit say to me, now is the time. I looked around and see who was still in the choir stand. I said, what you say? <laughs> and he said it again, now is the time. I'm not one to say God speaks to me all the time because he don't, but that time I knew it was God. And so I, I made up in my mind that, uh, okay, I gotta go. It wasn't an easy transition because like you say, it's like your baby. You built it from the beginning. You've watched it grow. You've seen the changes. You just, you know. But anyway, um, I started visiting other churches and um, none of them seemed to do anything for me. So then I went to Pastor Mitchell, Grady Emanuel. I would go there on Sunday nights because I was still at my church. So I knew I, would, I should not leave like that but anyway I would go on Sunday nights at first Sunday fourth Sunday and the spirit drew me and um so a couple of let me see November 2013 I told Pastor Lindsay that um I'm sorry but the Lord has led me to greater Emmanuel that didn't sit well with a lot of people but I got to do what I got to do for me because like you say the church don't take care of the widows. Uh, they paid my rent for six months. And after January, I was on my own. And, uh, you know, it, it is a very hard seat to sit in. Not to mention all the women that's after your man before we go. Then they all, you know, smiling in your face, trying to get next to your man. And then that talk about, you talked about him being a giver. We would go to workshop and everybody would just be begging him, begging him for money. I'm like, don't they know you got a wife and children here? <laughs> they didn't care. So everybody out there that took money from him, I would gladly accept it to help me on my way. <laughs> but God's been... That's just a sad joke, but God has been good to me. He's brought me all the way without a job, without a man. He has, I mean, I haven't want for anything. I haven't want for anything. So those are things that happened that I thought were unjust, unfair. Um, God dealt with it. With God made it all worth the while. You know, uh, I had to go through it to get where I am now. And he's never forsaken me, not one day. And I thank God for it. I mean, I get a little lonely sometimes. I run around here talking to Porky <laughs> and, uh, you know, tell him I missed him and fussing at him, why'd you leave? And, but God has been good to me. That, that's awesome. That's awesome. And, and a lot of time I thank people because it's such a soft, tender spot in your heart and mm -hmm. and a lot of people uh they sweep stuff under the rug not not yeah. that you you blaming or pointing the finger but uh uh not just in your case but it's it's something that's been happening across the country and maybe even around the world but i, I know i know now of several stories in the last four to five years where uh, uh, widows who were married to pastors, whether they were founding pastors or not, uh, had things in place and it didn't play out that way. Yeah. And I think the church 
uh, needs to rethink some things because mm -hmm. it's important. It's important. Even the pastors that are pastoring now, I mean, yeah. if, if God was to call them home, there needs to be, there needs to be things, things need to be in order and in place to make sure yeah. that the family uh, of this great man or woman of God is taken care of yeah. because yeah. of all mm -hmm. of the years. And uh, I know for me, when I was pastoring, I mean, uh, my credit, I mean, I signed for just about it. My name was on everything. And uh, yeah. I really wasn't getting no, uh, they talk about getting paid, Sarah, wasn't none of that, you mm -hmm. know. And I used to tell the church, I can take care of me, but I can't take care of me and the church 100% of the time. So part of that is the responsibility of the people. And I think a lot of times, sometimes we as pastors, if we're not careful, we make mistakes doing that. And so the people think, well, you know, hey, he going to pay it anyway, so I ain't got to, yeah, I, ain't, I don't have to pay it. And yeah. when it came for anniversary, you know, some of us, I know in Charles's case, in Bishop Craig's case, he didn't know what that was because as soon as we got our anniversary money, like in my case, you know, we wanted to make sure the church was, was in good shape. Yeah. And I know that was the case with, with Pastor Carwell for years, wanted to mm -hmm. make sure all the bills are paid. So when you do go home, home can be a haven of rest. You can go home and go to sleep and not toss and turn all night and wake up Monday morning trying to figure out how you're going to pay the bills, how you're going to take care of your staff and, yes. and all of that. That It's it's a worration. And so uh, I very well can relate uh, to those pastoral woes and what it's like. But I There's think a lot, a lot of, of people never give you know, just consideration to how that affects uh, the pastor's family, mm -hmm. his wife or his children. And so uh, that that's something to be uh, talked about and regarded. And maybe, you know, I know there are those who are doing workshops and seminar, grief seminars and workshops. So, so, so Sister Sherry, uh, uh, tell us, tell us that grief process, because I was there at the service and, and uh, was able to witness the home going of Pastor Carwell. And then going on from that day, after the, the sun went down on that day, your journey, uh, even before that, it started just getting through that week. And then now it's all done. And now you got to start a whole new life. What, what, what was that like for you? You got your mic is on mute. Well, my situation was a little different in the sense of um, I'm a, a vast majority of my husband's children didn't care for me. So they had it coming for me. And this was the opportunity at, to, to stick it to me. Um, one of the sons was the pastor. And uh, when I got to the church for the funeral, well, first of all, the car never came for me. Uh, when I got to the funeral, my name was taken out the obituary and it was not the obituary that I had put together. So they wow. told all the preachers not to acknowledge me and presented the flag to uh, one of the grant, to the one of the, I think the son got it. Just did a whole bunch of, dumb stuff um but it had been that was a situation honestly there was dysfunction before i even came to the situation between them that really had nothing to do with me but the way to get to him was always to try to get at me and because he wasn't here to protect me i just they really stuck it to me um as it relates to the grieving process, it's been 15 years and it is not a day that goes by. I don't think about him. I, sometimes I will ask myself, is this crazy to think about somebody every day? To think about somebody all day, you know, just in the little things. And you would think at some point it would go away. But for me, I think about him every day, but I thank God 
it's not in a sad way. Uh, there was a time which is boo 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 boo, and one day I realized, man, I only cried twice today, or I only cried three times this week. And you will get to a point where you don't cry every day, you know. But <laughs> it never, never. You learn to to live with it, but you never get over it, you know. And people have said things to me like. Well, y'all was only married five years. Well, at that time, the time that we had been together from dating and marriage, that was a, a great majority of my adult life. So for me, it was a long time because I haven't <laughs> lived that long. And people just don't even understand. They say all this crazy stuff, but when you live with a person, it, it's just, it is very, very, um, it's a lonely, lonely feeling you can go through, you know, um, getting to the point where, you know, you realize at some point I need to throw his toothbrush away and I need to do this. You know, I am still trying to part with some things, you know, but I am very clear that he's not coming back. I'm not, I never wanted to be, I think it was different for me because Reverend always, because of the age difference, he always talked to me about it. He always talked about the things he wanted me to do after he died and things like that. He always wanted me to live in my life. Even with him, he would always say, I've lived before you was here. You live your life. And so I go to school now, even with knowing that I need to keep going to make him proud, you know, because that's what he wanted me to do. And um No, I never wanted to be like Coretta Scott King where you just stuck, 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 stuck. You know what I'm saying? But um, when you're married to a person like a Jalen Caldwell, like a Charles Craig, legendary men, it's just, you just don't be seeing nothing else out here. And uh, if God should want for me to get married again, he will make that so, but I'm not in a hurry. I'm in content. I am content. And I was blessed. I was really, really blessed to have a husband who I traveled the world and a lot of things I know I had to say. My husband made those things happen for me and changed my life, you know, and I am a better person because of that. So I don't want to keep being emotional, but, um, <laughs> you know, all I can tell, tell you is that God will never let faithfulness go unrewarded. And as the wise of these, as the wise of a pastor, you know, you have to understand at the end of the day, their name is on the marquee and the people really are about him. People will love you, they will tolerate you, but at the end of the day, <laughs> it's about him. I try to tell pastors' wives, you know, they, they really get caught up and then they find out, no, it really wasn't about you. You was just kind of there with him, you know. Um, but I will say I do have two stepsons that, that still check on me, look out for me, and we have a beautiful relationship. And, um, their children, uh, they honor me, they call me granny and all that kind of stuff. So we have, we, you know, I still see, uh, I still see Reverend in them and that's a blessing. Uh, Burnett has a wonderful new pastor that's doing an awesome job. Uh, and I could not be more happy to have Ryan Johnson as the pastor. Uh, he used to come to the church when he was a kid and play for us. And it's almost like the story of uh, David, you know, he ended up being in the palace. So I'm excited to see his legacy continuing. You know, it is a blessing to still see the work going on because so many, so many churches have closed, you know, but Burnett is still going strong since 1953. Um, so I'm grateful for Aww. that. But I'm shut up now. <laughs> well, you know that's that's that that's a noteworthy testimony, and um, 
and I know uh, the, these kinds of conversations are, are tear jerkers. I mean, you know, uh, it's, I don't care how long it's been, you know, uh, when God made a J. Allen Conwell, he made him, uh, like the Bible say, we are uh, uniquely made. We, yeah. we're, we're just, I mean, the mold of who we are, our personalities, you know, God is, is so awesome. That's why he's God. You know, there, there, there is no other. I mean, you can't, you can't duplicate a copy, you know, that original design of a man such as a J. Allen Carwell and a Charles Ashley Craig. I mean, they, they were what God designed and made them to be. And all that they did uh, for us in ministry and, and in music, I mean, it's just unforgetful. And I think you some people what? make the mistake. Yeah. Go ahead. You I'm say sorry. Something? I, I just wanted to insert, you know, um, I was always a fan of the Craig Brothers. And uh, every now and then, uh, when they have a music or something, I would tell Reverend, I wanted to go to the church or something. One time he even came with me. But he would tell me, he would say, I wonder how the boys are doing. He always called them boys because he literally watched them grow up. He was very good friends with their father. And he always spoke highly of him. Um, and even uh, I, I found pictures of um, uh, the uncle. And so uh, Reverend would sometimes send me over to the church with a couple hundred dollars, tell me, give that to the boys. Make mm -hmm. sure they're doing okay. You know, so I, and I always wonder like, why, why did he say that? But I guess, you know, seeing them start a church from scratch, I think that was really something for him to see them grow up and become men and, he was he was really proud of them. So I just wanted to share that part. Um, yeah. I will always feel close to the Craig family because that was one family that my husband always spoke highly of. You know, it was uh, the Craigs and um, the Mortons and uh, just certain the, the Clarks. He saw these people, these giants in our city, but he saw them grow up from little kids, you know, and he would talk about how their father would bring them over to the broadcast as little kids and how they grew up. So um, it's just amazing that I have been able to, I wasn't there in the first hand part of it, but I feel like I'm part of the history because Jalen always spoke so highly <laughs> of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you too, Bishop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he, yeah, he I spoke mean. Of you. We try not to use worldly inflections in the church, but I mean, you couldn't help but call him the Godfather. I mean, you know, he knew everybody. He respected mm -hmm. everybody of all ages. Every pastor in this city knew who he was, and and uh, that that's that's such, that's so awesome. Uh, same way with uh, uh, Bishop Craig. One of the things that I admire. Uh, about them, uh, Bishop Craig and and his brother Bishop James Lindsay. I mean, when when they when they would team up in a service. I mean, I mean, and I I love church. I grew up in a spiritual church. A lot of folks yeah. like to talk about spiritual church, but I'm a spiritual church baby. And let me let me help y'all who don't know what that is. The word spiritual is not a denomination. It's universal. <laughs> Because every church ought to be a spiritual church. Amen. Every church ought to be a church of deliverance. Every church ought to be a church of prayer. You know, so these names, don't y'all get caught up on that. Because uh, half of the folk that was talking about it was there on Sunday night. That's that's mm -hmm. what got me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would come on Sunday Nick night. Nick and Nick so uh, uh, one, one of the things that was so awesome was, was their ability uh, uh, in worship experiences is not only through the word, but through the music, the word through music would captivate, you know, uh, uh, audiences, concerts, and, and just a, a regular service. And, and you can't duplicate that. There, I don't know no church, even at my church, we, every church got its own autonomy and personality, eventually, spiritually, 
but I did know and don't know even to this day of no church that would have a worship experience like Craig Memorial. They had their own distinct identity. Same yeah. thing with Burnett in the day uh, uh, that broadcast, that broadcast. I mean, I, I never was there on a Sunday morning, so uh, I'm sure it was it was fervent and it was high praise. But everybody in the city, in the country, knew about that broadcast in the evening. You know, Amen. I mean, you know, Bishop, uh, my husband actually was brought before the the pastor's council. Uh, they wanted him to take Baptist off of the church name because they felt that Burnett was not representative of what a Baptist church was supposed to be. Well, they were speaking in tongues and he was letting women preach. And <laughs> uh, uh, he said when he let Shirley Caesar come in, that was a big whoop de doo, you know. And yeah, uh, they had uh, one time he was not at the council and they brought him up at a meeting and Reverend C.L. Franklin gave them some nice choice words, uh, told him none of your business would go on in the man pulpit. You know, my husband, he believed in laying hands on people and yeah. you know, anointing people with oil. And, and I have to say, you know, even when I got there, I saw a lot of things. We had a, a prophet and all that. It was the thing that I had never seen before. Uh, we fellowship with the Nero's. Uh, yeah, we, landmark you know, temple of deliverance. Yeah, we did a lot of things that most Baptist churches did not do, and I yeah. love my because uh, he in the seventies had to. Uh, you know about it when he would do the march on sin. He collaborated with AME and yeah. all of these people, white, black. I don't know how he did it, uh, but. Not only was he a moderator, but he was, I'm telling you, these people from all over different denominations, he could get them to come together and yeah. march on sin. You know, where they do that at, <laughs> you know? And anytime my husband would send me to tell somebody he wanted them to come, they would always say, when is it? Nobody ever told him no, you know? and. It was amazing. Like I said, white people, black people, Kojic, whatever. Yeah. Bishop Brooks, he knew. Yeah. I mean, when I say knew these people, he knew these people. And they counted him as friends. And so I've learned through that, you know, um, it's not about denominations, it's about doing the work of the Lord and the work of the kingdom. So I just want to throw that in there too. Yeah, the Craig yeah. brothers would be singing at that March on Sin. Yeah. They yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Though those days, and when you when you hear people, we just come out of our conference and after this, and we talk about the glory of uh, of the latter house. Mm -hmm. It's going to be greater than the former. And when, when I think about the, the high church, like Bishop Mitchell said on Friday night, when I think about, you mean to tell me we're getting ready to go into a period in history where the glory of the Lord is going to be greater than what we've already seen? My God. And, and I remember some, some Holy Ghost filled times in church where people were yes. getting healed and delivered. And, and see, that's that's the thing that I liked about uh, even the Craig Brothers, uh, Craig Memorial's concerts. They were not just musical concerts. They were worship services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would take praise breaks. We would pray. And, they, and if people got saved, healed, delivered. I mean, it all happened in what was dubbed as a concert. You right. know? But, right. but it was really concert slash church. Church slash ministry slash evangelism, you know, because uh, everybody knew what was going to happen uh, in March at their concerts. And even the times that uh, uh, they went to Ford Auditorium, and I'm dating myself now because that was too late, back too in late. the day, you know, <laughs> you know, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a blessing and a joy to uh, recall these memories. And I am so excited for you all. 
and proud of you all, how you have stood and how you have continued uh, to, to live and to witness and not just shut yourself off from the world. And then, of course, I know this this time is not easy. Just having this conversation yeah. and, and this far away from those days, but still, the fact remains uh, because I still have my periods of time. I mean, that was my friend, and Pastor yeah. Carwell was just like like a father figure. He was he was a friend to Detroit. He was a friend to preachers. Period, mm -hmm. and and you can never forget those people that gave you opportunities in ministry and uh, was not insecure. Amen. I, you know, and I really worry about this, this, this culture and, and this church today uh, that got preachers and pastors. I know there's been a change in the guard, but I pray that uh, they be free from any envy and jealousy and insecurity and all of that stuff. I mean, you got to let all that stuff go and learn how to be universal and, and, and fellowship and lock arms with everybody. I mean, you don't know who, who can help you. Uh, and so uh, when I look at Detroit now, I mean, I look at the, the climate of the church. And now that we've come through this pandemic, I'm just praying that church be different. Amen. You know, we cannot go back to what we were doing, the way we were doing it. And then, uh, of course, in a case of the widows. Now, saints, y'all learn how to take care of the widows now. And the often that's how your church is going to be tremendously blessed. A lot of folk don't believe it, but it's in the word of God that we do so. And I think of so many, I don't want to start calling names, or I know of experiences somewhat like you all's today. So I want to thank you all for sharing, you know, some of your story and everybody don't need to know everything, you know, yeah. but, but you shared enough to give us an inside scoop on what it's been like and how the Lord has tremendously blessed you from then up till today. What a, what a, what an awesome testimony. And I appreciate you for it. Anything that either one of you want to say to some of these, uh, pastors' wives or new wives or those that are engaged to be wives, or what, especially <laughs> if they're going into a, marrying a pastor. Uh, it's not easy, and don't be looking for the fluff. You got to get in there and get down with the people uh, and be watchful and prayerful. And don't take everybody as your friend. Uh, you just got to take Jesus as your partner and talk to your husband and um, be with your husband. Don't let him be by himself all the time either. Amen. Let them know that he's got a wife. Yeah. I will say uh, everybody don't want your husband and some people do, but you be secure in your own marriage and yes, everything so. will work all, all right because so many wives have run away good people. Some wives have helped really help destroy some churches. Being doing too much. You know, let the nurses be the yes, nurses. They have. Let these people do what they're supposed to do because at the end of the day, the church is what, 80% women anyway. So you're going to have to deal with them. You understand what I'm saying? You got to know what you're signing up for. But, but be secure. You know, insecurity will kill you. It will kill the ministry. And you can run some really good people away with some false information, false ideas, you know, and all of that. And that's, that's not necessary. Love on the people. And the more love you show, they will love on you. You'll look up one day and they'll be giving you your own little envelopes and stuff during the pastor's anniversary. <laughs> you come to church and somebody brought something for you, you know, because one thing about it, people love their pastor. And when they see their pastor is happy and taken care of, they will begin to love on you too. So that's my little advice. <laughs> Amen to that. That's Good priceless word. advice. And I, I'm, I'm sure those that, that are listening and those that might view this later, 
where we'll take that to heart and especially to you ladies who are uh, either you're dating your uh, a pastor and you're preparing to get married or you're already married to a pastor, uh, those are words of advice I'm sure you could take and use and apply it to your own lives. Blessings to you. Thank you all, ladies. You have been so kind, so transparent, and uh, that's what ministry is all about. And I just believe that uh, since this is recorded, somebody might see it and be encouraged. Some, some, some widow, some pastor wife somewhere will be blessed by your uh, willingness to share your story. Well, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to be gone. Uh, listen, we, we, we've got more coming. This is my story starting next, next week. We want you to join me next Sunday. I'm going to be talking to the legendary uh, Jeffrey LaValle, Elder Jeffrey LaValle, okay. and talk about his story his journey from music to ministry, a uh, musician to an elder of the church, and a mu I mean just a chief physician, a chief uh, preacher, a chief uh, uh, praiser, a uh, chief musician and minister of music. We're going to be talking with him. June the 4th, this coming Friday, special spotlight on music with the one and only Joel Britton, one of Detroit's sons has been gone for years. Yes. Uh, and we're yes. going to be talking to Joel Britton this coming Friday at 9 p.m. Uh, right here on Bishop Andreas Woods' page, sponsored by the Fellowship of Music and Art. So we got a lot of things coming. And consult all of my pages. Now, y'all go to Fellowship of Music and Art, Interdenominational Assembly of Churches USA, Bishop Andre S. Woods page, Andre Sonny Woods page. You're going to see us on there somewhere with something going on. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to pray now for you ladies, and uh, we want to bless our people. Father, we thank you now uh, for these wonderful women that you've blessed, and we thank you for their lives. We thank you for their witness. We thank you for your keeping power, how you've kept them in spite of, of their tests, their trials. And God, now we speak life into their existence. We pray, God, for a provision for their lives continually. We pray that you will continue to soothe their spirits, their hearts, their minds. We pray that God, even now, as they remember their husbands, and uh, it's been time gone past, but thank you for your healing power. We thank you for precious memories and all that you've blessed them to do. And now, God, as they find themselves uh, going from day to day, we pray that you will be there to continue to comfort and to be able to hold them as the apple of your eye. Bless them now, whatever they stand in need of, every desire uh, of their heart, we pray that you will give it to them in Jesus' name. And we'll be so happy to give you the praise. Yes, Glory Lord. and honor is all yours. Yes, we yes. thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and thank Amen. God. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for sharing with us. Those of you that might have had a chance to jump on, uh, you can see it later. And I want to command the blessings of the Lord. To I receive it. That is my prayer. Bless you, ladies. We'll talk. We, as soon as okay. this thing you open, y'all know we're going to dinner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Bless you now. Okay. Have a blessed day. Love you. Love you too. Bye-bye.